The holiday season in Brussels is coming to an end and next week the makeup of the new European Commission will be announced. Ursula von der Leyen's team will almost immediately face a litany of problems. Sluggish growth in the European Union, political weakness in France and Germany, two of the EU's biggest economies, the ongoing war in Ukraine and many others. So how will the Commission tackle the challenges? Well, here to discuss this issue with us is Eric Nielsen, the Group Chief Economist at Unicredit. Good evening, Eric. Good evening. Thank you so much for your time. And let's start with the big players now. So the European Union's new Executive Commission and newly elected Parliament are starting their new term. What are the top challenges they should be addressing? Well, there are very many, um, uh, and as you have seen uh, from uh, from various commentators, uh, they range from the uh, imminent discussion of uh, the fiscal rules, where France is, seems to be in trouble. Uh, but it also goes, of course, uh, more importantly, in many ways, to the to the global issues that which are facing Europe now. Uh, uh, this is the uh, starting with. The issues between the U.S. and China, its issues of climate change, and as you mentioned in your in your introduction, the the issue of uh, of of the war in Ukraine and how Europe reacts and and yeah reacts to it. We're seeing increasing paralysis in the EU's top economies. I also mentioned that in the intro, France and Germany. To what extent is this going to hamper any ambitious economic policy by the Commission? Let's be blunt. Uh, it's devastating. There is a, a. It's as you as you correctly saw of, of, of said in the introduction. There's a lot to be said about the, the European Commission and the incoming overall Commission under von der Leyen's leadership. Uh, we don't know whether the Commission is going as is being appointed is going to be uh, uh, approved by the European Parliament. So my, first of all, let's, let's recognize there's a couple of months at least to go until it's in place and up and running. But the key point here is that nothing really gets done in Europe without German and French leadership. This is the reality of it. The power ultimately sits in the European capitals and uh, the two biggest economies, as you correctly said, Germany and France, are both uh, in some various degrees of political uh, no man's land. So uh, without Paris and, 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 uh, and uh, Berlin working properly and at full speed and in sync, which they don't do either now, um, there's so little really Europe can do, unfortunately. If we look at Germany, for example, I mean, there's been much talk about the lack of competitiveness and innovation, the inability to turn flagships like Volkswagen around. Is Germany again the sick man of Europe? Um, I don't like the term, but uh, but if you mean it in the way that is discussed in the in the media, generally speaking, lower growth than the average and uh, dragging down growth generally. The answer is yes. Um, but let me say, I don't think it's fair to, uh, or it's correct to pin it on the corporates per se. Volkswagen was in, have been in the news. Or it's an important issue. Uh, uh, but fundamentally, right, Germany runs a big current account surplus, means that they are, on normal standards or definitions, competitive. The problem is that domestic demand has not picked up for five years. Domestic demand in Germany today, in level terms, is the same as in 2019. And that has to do with a whole lot of things, including macroeconomic policies, the, the, the budget, uh, the debt break, and of course, monetary policies to some extent. Well, when we talk about monetary policy or indeed the EU economy, it has stagnated for months. It seems no one's really addressing the issue, including the European Central Bank, which has been slow to respond with cutting interest rates to spur growth. How are the financial markets responding to this? Well, the uh, European financial markets have been, uh, uh, so maybe you could say surprisingly well behaved uh, for an economy, the Eurozone economy, which have, has, as, as we talked about, not grown at all in terms of domestic demand for five years. 
But that's because equity markets, stock markets in Europe are driven to a very large extent by America. And America is doing very well uh, in terms of economic terms, not politically maybe, but but in terms of, of, of economic uh, growth. So, so that has driven or pulled along European equities to a, to a significant extent. And in fixed income markets, where most people probably would have anticipated that this type of growth, uh, poor growth outlook, would have constrained the fixed income markets, and particularly when it comes to the sovereign spreads between, say, Germany and Italy, that has also behaved amazingly well. I mean, we have spreads in the vicinity of 150 basis points, and we, in the good old days, thought that 200 was a was an okay number. So it, it's really uh, remarkable, but we can talk more about this, and this has much more to do with, with fundamentally good economic policies in Italy than it has to do with Europe, and, and it has to do with the central bank's policy setup, obviously. You mentioned America there. Let's talk about that. And just over two months, they'll have a new president. And in the US, we've seen protectionism on the rise. We've seen Republican candidate Donald Trump vowing to raise tariffs on all imports. What should the EU's response be? Um, first of all, uh, uh, they won't have a new president uh, until January. So we have, a, we have two months more than you indicated. Uh, and uh, and hopefully we have, well, we will have by then. Um, it's it's tough to say. Uh, I mean, but you put your what the European response should be. But you put your finger on exactly the right spot. That if Donald Trump wins, the at least he promises to go down further this road of protectionism, or nationalism, which uh, he had in his previous uh, period as president. And as to be honest, uh, Joe Biden has also done to a significant extent, not on terrorists, but on on various protection measures, the famous IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, really is to a large extent. It's a climate change act, but it's it's more than an inflation reduction act, and it is a protectionist act, a industrial policy. Um, so um, what the next president does or does not do, I don't know. Uh, and I and I'm hesitant to say what the response should be, because the worst thing you can imagine for global growth and European growth is tit for tat. That said, it's an illusion to think politically, I think, that America, say under Donald Trump, can raise taxes on import from Europe by the 20% he has suggested without Europe taking countermeasures and probably retaliatory measures. And I would say with a very high probability that certainly China would do so. So it's so it's it's a it's a very very dangerous outlook for the global economy under a Donald Trump, without a shade of a doubt. And you're very right. Forgive me. Voters go to the polls in two months. A new president uh, will be in place by January. Bill Clinton famously said, "The economy stupid." It seems these days it's a little bit politics stupid. Do you feel like politics is killing globalization as we know it? Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. To be honest, um, so it's. Um, uh, let me say first on with regard to the to the American economy. By any measure, uh, it's doing. It has been doing during the last four years fantastically well in terms of top job creation and growth. Uh, and the only really imbalance in the American economy is the fiscal deficit, which is way too high. Uh, we can discuss whether that's sustainable or not, but it is. But that's the big uh, uh, imbalance. And strangely enough, that is not being discussed whatsoever, to my knowledge, in the campaign. That, you know, and the reason, of course, is that both candidates are promising fiscal policy measures, which is going to, on all serious estimates, expand the deficit a bit. Uh, a bit if it's Kamala Harris, potentially by a lot if it is Donald Trump. And this is sort of independent research that we can talk about, but it's, and we're going to discuss how much they get to do, but it's, but none of them are campaigning, is campaigning on a platform of reducing the deficit, right? So it's, but, but, but the economy is not doing well. However, the politics of it has not played the same way. If you, the survey suggests that big groups of, of the population does not feel that they're doing so well. 
And and this comes back, back, in my opinion, to probably the single biggest issue between us economists and the politics of the place of the post-inflation period we have. We economists are happy that inflation has come back to broadly where it came from. But a big part of the population is concerned, and rightly so, that the price levels remain high. And that translates then into the so-called uh, cost of living crisis. And that makes people unhappy, and that unhappy, and that is probably to a large extent what drives the uh, discontent and the and the politics of flirting or even driving towards the extreme right uh, in America, but also in Europe, in many countries in Europe, right? And you know of this in Poland as well, right? Eric Nelson, the Group Chief Economist at Unicredit. Thank you again for your time. Thanks for having me. And that's World News tonight. Do stay with us here on TVP World. I'm Aaron Darman. Good night.